Hello, my name is Mike Young. I'm a mediator with Judica West, and uh, with me is my colleague, John Wagner, who will introduce himself in a second. Today, we've been thinking of different ways to title this program, and I think the one we like best is Don't Suck at Mediation. Is that right? That's right. All That's right. right. Uh, I've been mediating since 1989. I handle mostly commercial IP and employment mediations. Uh, before that, I was with the law firm of Alston and Bird. Uh, and just so you know, our views today are our own personal views based on our years of experience. Uh, and there's a lot of years of experience. They are not necessarily the views of Judicate West. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'll tell my legend. Because a legend is what every man has. And it's what you would tell, uh, like to tell other people about yourself. So here's what I like to tell right. about me. I'll tell you if it's true or not. All right, you do that. Uh, I uh, practiced law as a trial lawyer, and then uh, at the tender age of 31, uh, somehow found myself appointed as a United States Magistrate Judge in the Northern District of Oklahoma. And it was back when uh, uh, that was the busiest court in the country after the, the oil boom, the oil bust, the banking bust, the real estate bust, and along with the uh, savings and loan fiasco. So we were carrying about double the normal caseload of any uh, other federal uh, court in the country. And we were desperate, absolutely desperate. And so as a result of that, I founded and then it administered uh, for over 10 years a court annex mediation program. Uh, after uh, I finished up with the bench, I was invited to come out to California with Irel Manella and set up the uh, Irel Manila ADR Center. Did that for about eight years and then started in with Judicate West where we became colleagues and friends. And here we are ready to share our knowledge uh, for lawyers out there so that you too will not suck at mediation. Um, let's start with some nightmare stories. So maybe John tell us a story uh, some kind of nightmare mediation that you've had that we can then use as a learning piece. Oh, it's way too fresh. Uh, this one was a bad injury case. Uh, they were out doing construction and uh, had to put up a soundproof fence because they didn't want the birds on the other side to be disturbed. Uh, the Santa Ana winds came down and they blew the fence over and uh, uh, they closed down the construction site and uh, our plaintiff went out there with one of the foremen and they were standing on this very heavy soundproof fence when a 90 mile per hour Santa Ana wind came and blew them eight feet in the air. They go up, they come down, this guy lands on his head and breaks his neck, okay? It's called a hangman's break. Uh, normally it's fatal, but luckily there was somebody on site that had training uh, doing rock climbing or whatnot, was able to immobilize the guy's head and, and saved his life. Uh, it turns out he wasn't paralyzed or anything, and uh, he was a nice guy, could walk and talk, wasn't in a wheelchair, uh, but I mean, he was really hurt. A lot of medical, and uh, it was a really serious case. So, uh, before the mediation, the plaintiff's lawyer goes, and he makes a policy limits demand. It's a six million dollars in insurance on this. And, uh, and that was all well and good. Of course, the other side didn't respond to it. And we get to the mediation and the plaintiff's lawyer tells me, first thing, my demand is now $10 million. Great. Don't you love it when they go that oh, backwards? Man, I'll tell you. It puts you in a crack because what do you do? Uh, with the other side. They come in here with these expectations. They're going to settle this case for less than $6 million, and now we're up to 10. Well, I got off on the wrong foot with the claims adjuster on the other side because of that. You know, she thought it was my fault the guy went out. Uh, and, I, and all during the day, she kept wanting to get up and walk out. She kept threatening, oh, we're out of here, we're out of here. They're not just being reasonable. And, 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 and John, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, but I don't think you're working hard enough for us. You're not working as hard as other mediators that, that our big insurance company uh, hires. Uh, we're just not happy with the way this is going. Of course, you know what that is. It's a veiled threat. I mean, they're telling me, you know, buck up, guy. Get us the result we want, or you're never going to get hired by this huge you're, insurance you're company. You're not on our list anymore. Not on you're your list. You're falling off. Yeah. You know, uh, you know that, that was a little irritating. Uh, 
I go back to the plaintiff's room, and and the, the plaintiff's lawyer takes me aside. And despite all the $10 million bluster, he, he whispers to me, he says, you know, John, I think I can get the client uh, to get down to about four and a half or $5 million. And, you know, just kind of as an aside. Uh, so, you know, I've got that data, and I'm kind of working it. Uh, you know, in this this claims adjuster, it, it just I kept getting worse. Uh, I mean, during the course, I bet there were five times during the course of the day, they said to me, you know, we're out of here. Finally, I just had enough. And I said, you know, if you want to walk, walk, okay? Uh, do it. Go ahead. Get up and walk out. It's kind of a silly thing to do at this point because I'm making progress in the other room. Uh, but if you're going to walk out, at least coordinate it with me so we can can uh, get some some effect out of it. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, but in any event, quit threatening because it's getting annoying and it's not, not productive here. Uh, so, anyhow, we go on and we get down to the end of the first day. And we're, our, our brackets here, you know, the... the the defendant or the plaintiff still wants nine million dollars. Defense has finally put half a million dollars on the table, uh, and you know the adjuster's just had it. She says, "I don't know what you've been doing all day, but, but this this is asinine." And I said, "Well, okay, let's try to use your walking out. Now's the time. You know, you're actually ready to go do it, or kind of get into the end where you need to do it. Let me use it and see if I can get a concession from the other side." So I go over there. And we talked about conditional offers. When I get the plaintiff to finally do, uh, they said that they would drop it down from nine to five million if the defense uh, would put two million dollars on the table. Okay, go back in the defense room. They're all enthusiastic now. Okay, oh, this is great. Let's come back. I suggest, well, maybe you ought to use another mediator. You know, I got uh, I got my buddy Mike Young over here. He's great at this stuff. You know, and sometimes you just need a little different personality. We hand it off. You know, we call it sequential mediations. It's something we do here at Judicate West. Uh, they have none of it. They wanted to come back to me. So we come back, second session, another day. And the, the walkout threats continue. I mean, it's just like this is the only way they know how to negotiate. We're going to get up and walk out. You know, they start telling me I'm not doing a good job again. They, they do all that. Finally, I have a belly full of that. And I say to them, fine. Okay, I give a money back guarantee. You don't like the way I'm doing this mediation. Uh, you don't care for this process. That's fine. Let's shut it down right now. I'll refund your money and we'll call it good. They declined. They wanted to keep going. All right, so we get going. And, and how's, we, the, how's the plaintiff side? Are they at least nice and reasonable during this process? Is it the problem all on the defense side? Or? I, I love the plaintiff. I mean, the plaintiff, he's just yeah. a stand up guy, he's like an ape plus witness. I mean, he tells a story, he doesn't exaggerate. I, I mean, he makes the case. And the defense knows it. You know, they've deposed this guy. They know what he's like. Um, so all the nightmare parts happening in the adjuster room. Well, except for the money, you know, except for the money. The lawyers just just keep pumping this thing up. And, uh, it, it, you know, I'm not making much progress on that side. Uh, so finally we get to a point where I've got the plaintiffs down to a little over three million bucks. And I've got the, uh, the defense to 1.8. Uh, and they said, this is it. They do, do what I call a hard stop. They're not going to move beyond that. I said, well, I don't know if there's much more I can do in the other room, if that's as far as we'll go, but I'll try. I'll go over there, and I'll try to get them to bid against themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, occasionally they'll do that. So I tried it. No dice. That didn't work. And uh, so, you know, we're essentially done. And... Uh, uh, Defense says, oh, we're going to walk out. I said, fine. I think it's, it's, we've done all we can do. I go back into the plaintiff's room. I talk to the plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, I said, we're done. You know, we've gotten as far as we can. I think he really wanted to settle the case. Uh, so he says, John, uh, will you follow up with this? You know, will, will you continue to stick with us and maybe work it by phone or email or whatnot? And for the first time in 30 years, I said, no. No, I'm not going to do that. Not with these folks. I have, I have so burned my bridges uh, with the defense side that I don't think it'll do any good. 
I really think that if you're going to do that, you need to bring somebody else in because I think I'll do more harm than good. So I go back to my office um, and uh, I'm sitting there and I get a text and, uh, and it's the plaintiff's lawyer. He says, can you come on out to the lobby? So I go out to the lobby. It turns out while they are standing in the elevator lobby, getting ready to go down uh, the elevator, uh, the, the plaintiff's lawyer came out and offered to settle with the, the, the defense for $2 million and waiver of a worker's comp lien. Now, I had told the, the defense that I could probably get it there earlier on. I didn't have want anything to do with that. But when the plaintiff comes out and actually offers it, they say, yeah, and they settle the case standing there in front of the elevator. So we go back and we document it, and it's all done. Uh, very strange day. You know, and I, I guess guess the final kicker is, is that I got stiffed on my bill. <laughs> By both sides or just the defense? I won't say. All right, never mind. All right, so that's, the, I don't know. I guess that's a nightmare. Uh, it certainly felt like a nightmare to you. It seems like since you ended up settling the case at the end, it could have been worse. So could here, have been worse. Here's my nightmare, and I, we raise these stories to see if we can see some patterns that are in there in terms of what lawyers are doing that are good versus bad, helpful versus not helpful. And then we'll get into some, some specifics and we'll try to break this down a little bit. Um, mine's um, shorter. It was an employment case where I walked in, I'm dealing with uh, lawyers on both sides I hadn't seen before, I hadn't worked with before. I go into the plaintiff's room, there's two plaintiff's lawyers. They're standing at the very far end of the conference room on the other side of the table with their backs towards me and their plaintiff, their client is sitting at the table. So I walk in and, and say, hi, everyone, you know, I'm Mike Young. Um, they kind of turn around, but they just stare at me. No introductions, no hellos, no smiles, no anything. So I walk down the conference room, around the table, to shake their hands to say hello to them, and they kind of like, you know, begrudgingly stick their hand out. Uh, and the first thing out of their mouth is, how much are they going to pay us? Well, I mean, that's what we're here today to find out. Let's, let's see what we can do. Uh, let me introduce myself to your client. Don't, don't talk to the client. Hey, Mike, when, when people try to cut to the chase, yeah. okay, and, 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 and push forward a mediation without going through the dance, does that work for you? Yeah, well, you're about to find out. This is why this is my nightmare uh, mediation. Yeah. Um, they didn't want to talk about the case. They didn't want me to talk to their client. They were insisting that this is a million-dollar case. They want their million dollars. Go in there, Mike, to the defense side and get them to pay us the million dollars. That was my opening session with the plaintiffs and the plaintiff's lawyer. And essentially, they kicked me out because they didn't want to talk anymore. So the defense side is um, wondering about me, too. They were at least pleasant. We had nice pleasantry. We had, we, I learned a little bit more about the case than I had from the briefs. They shared a little bit with me. Um, uh, when I told them that the plaintiff's demanding a million dollars, they were like, Mike, what are you doing? Yeah. This case, it's a fifty to $75,000 case. Why are you even coming to me with a million dollar demand? So the whole day was like that. The plaintiff's lawyers refused to discuss the case with me, refused to let me talk to the plaintiff directly. Um, so I, you know, now we have to dance a little bit. So this is the dynamics. What can we do to try to make some progress um, you know, I'd like to ask them why they think it's a million dollar case. They're, they're not really engaging at that kind of a level. So I was going to bring the lawyers together. Nobody wants to talk to each other. There, there were two lawyers on each side. You know, they were playing, I wouldn't say good cop, bad cop. It was much more like bad cop, worse cop. <laughs> so I took the two bad cops and thinking that was the best I had. And the three of us sat down in, in a room just to kind of talk about what's going on and why aren't we able to kind of address some of these issues and make some progress, uh, they started yelling at each other. I said, all right, this is not working. So we stopped that. Uh, at, at the end of the day, we made almost no progress. The million maybe came down to 900000 or something like that. Defense lawyers are looking at me like I'm a complete idiot if I can't even get the plaintiff down to a reasonable level. In the plaintiff's room, I can't talk to anybody. I can't figure out what's going on and why they're acting this way. Um, so unlike your nightmare, Mine ended with no settlement, but I did learn a little while later that the plaintiff's lawyer was up on bar charges for stealing a million dollars from his client, a 
prior client. So I think he was using this case as in an effort to get his million dollars back. And that might have been the underlying current that was never surfaced that uh, kind of helped stop us from getting a deal done. But I remember the day that this mediation happened, where it was, who it was. It is ingrained in my memory because it's, of course, the one I want to forget the most. Of course, these are the folks you'd love to go back and work with. Yeah, well, you know, I haven't mediated with either side since, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> all right, so look, they're not all that bad. Um, we, we have some fantasy mediations, too. And maybe if uh, just a short story of a, a fantasy mediation that you've had, and then we'll be able to compare these things and get into some of the details about what you as lawyers can do to make mediation much more successful um, and avoid the, the nightmares. So do you have one? I, I have one. Okay. I, it, it was one of the most pleasant cases I've had in a long time. It was booked for a full day. I came in, it was an insurance coverage case. Uh, the lawyers and the clients were all experienced uh, professionals. They knew what they were doing. The clients are there, they had full settlement authority. They thoroughly understood all the key issues in the case, uh, those issues have been articulated in short, punchy, well-written, non-repetitive briefs that were exchanged in advance. Uh, they provided the policy in question to me in advance, so I had a chance to read it and, and figure out what the, the, the beef was. Uh, they came in, they had done some, some negotiations beforehand with reasonable uh, negotiation brackets. Uh, they, I met with them separately, they were candid and caucus. They each admitted what their, their uh, strengths and weaknesses were and that this was just uh, an issue that ultimately was going to probably be decided in the appellate courts and they didn't really want it to go there. Um, so, you know, we were ready. Uh, I made a suggestion for settlement, uh, a mediator's proposal, probably by 10.30 in the morning. Both sides accepted it. Uh, one side was there with a, a draft settlement agreement ready to go. And so we had it signed, sealed, delivered, documented um, before noon, and we all had a nice lunch together. <laughs> so how many of those do you have? Right. Well, I can count one. <laughs> yeah, right, so it's that memorable. Um, uh, all right, so, so my, my fantasy mediation was uh, another employment case. This was a pregnancy discrimination case. It was a young woman who came to the mediation with her husband, uh, she had been a snowboarder, uh, and a pretty good snowboarder before an injury kind of derailed her career. But she grew up in this small town where she spent most of her childhood in the main snowboard shop where they, um, uh, you know, all the snowboarders hung out and, and whatnot. This was like their hangout club. So eventually she started to work for this, this, co this company, and she worked her way up to a, a senior level. Um, and then she got married to another snowboarder, kind of a hothead guy, but he was a nice guy. Uh, and eventually got pregnant, and then shortly thereafter was terminated. Uh, and defense side was terminated because of performance reasons, kind of the Peter Principle. Did my cell phone interrupt you? No, your cell phone was fine. Is this don't another, you, is don't this, you hate it when that happens? Is this another lesson that we're, <laughs> we're having? Turn your cell phone off before uh, the mediation? Yeah, but does anybody ever do that? Turn them off? Not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's old school. So, so this woman, anyway, she was um, uh, brought this pregnancy discrimination case. Both sides, you know, they liked each other. They knew each other. They grew up together. They went to church together. Um, and here's the kind of the point of the story. It, other lawyers would have focused on this case as a money case. How much did she earn? How much did she, was she out of, business, uh, out of work afterwards? Uh, did she mitigate and that kind of stuff? These lawyers were smart enough to recognize that this was not really a money case. You know, when I, and they allowed me to talk to the parties to find out what was going on. You know, it turns out the woman didn't really want to bring the lawsuit at all because she loved these people. So this was her, this was her you know, big part of her identity growing up. Um, but her husband, the hothead, said, you can't disrespect my wife this way. You know, she's the greatest ever. I mean, you could see how devoted he was to her, and he just couldn't stand the fact that she got fired because of performance. So obviously it had to be something else. So he's the one who's driving the lawsuit. Um, eventually, we started exploring lots of different ways to settle the case because this snowboard shop, it's not a 
big money maker. This is much more labor of love for everybody. Uh, and so everyone started brainstorming ideas. And we ended up getting a settlement that involved, um, believe it or not, the plaintiff's lawyer was paid a snowboard. The plaintiff's <laughs> law firm was given employee discounts at this shop for you know five years or so. Um, the employer was okay with that because he makes money on, even with the employee discount, but the, the law firm got something. Um, and the best part of it was both sides really wanted to reconcile. The lawyers were smart enough to see that and to allow it to happen. So at the very end, we had a moment where all the parties came together, no lawyers. Uh, they had a prayer circle. The husband um, did, did the prayer for everybody. I got blessed, so I felt very good about that. Um, and we had hugs and tears at the end. So tr there was a true kumbaya moment at the end of that one. Um, and a lot of the credit goes to the lawyers because they allowed that kind of mediation to happen. Um, so there we go. So those are, those are a couple stories. And now what can we take from these stories? What can we learn from these so that uh, we can actually have more fantasies in the future and less nightmares? Well, what's the difference? What makes the difference between the fantasy and the nightmare? Um, I think it starts with the briefs. Ah. And I think with our with the program materials, now, now you're, you're assuming you get briefs. I'm assuming we get briefs. Do you Although, always get briefs? I don't always, and I don't always need briefs. I mean, if we have a good conversation with the lawyer ahead of time, before the mediation, I will learn everything I'm going to learn in a brief, and then a whole lot more, um, so that the briefs aren't always necessary. Sometimes they are. It depends on the com complexity of the of the dispute, but. Um, you know, I think the briefs... But what if you don't have the conversation? You don't have the pre-mediation conference, okay? So what you're doing is you're showing up there in the morning, right? And, and you've been looking for a brief, right? And you're looking through your emails, you're, you're looking through, through your, your uh, website at Judicate West, you're looking through all the stuff because you think you missed it, right? right? You missed the brief. It's out there someplace, you missed the brief, you can't find it, you come in, you go to the front desk, you say, Susie, did a brief come in? On this case, they scramble around, look around, no, no, they, there's no brief on this, okay? So you go back there, the mediation's starting in 10 minutes, uh, and you get, you get a, a call in your office, right? And you know what happens? It's Susie, right? Mm -hmm. And Susie's saying, the lawyers just came in, and they brought yeah. a brief. Yes. Right? Right. How big is the brief? 50 pages. Something like this with yeah. all the exhibits, right? Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, can I just say not helpful? Yeah. Okay, not, not helpful. Not helpful. Um, it is true in the old days. I started mediating in 1989. We would, and the way we were trained, uh, we would sit in the big room, like big conference room, and the mediator would be at the big chair, the big boy chair at the end, and the parties, plaintiffs on this side, defense on this side, and we'd say, tell us about your case. And then they'd stand up and tell about the case, and the defense would tell about their case, and that's how we would learn what this dispute we was We got named for that. Yeah, we call it the good old days. The good old days, right? Yeah. So there were not no briefs. It's perfectly yeah. fine to, to do without briefs, but the briefs can be helpful. They can be a very um, strategic document and something that can help us as mediators if they're done right. Um, and so let me give you a couple points on at least what works for me. And I know some of this John will agree with, and some he probably won't won't agree with. Uh, there should be a document with this videotape, uh, an article that describes the brief writing process a little bit more detailed. But I think the brief should be easy. Easy for you to write, easy for us to read. Easy. Um, they don't need to be complicated. Big, long summary judgment motions are really not very helpful. Uh, and I think we should think about the briefs this way. What is the goal of the brief? What are we trying to accomplish with the brief? It is not, you know, Iraq like we learned in law school, issue, rule, application, conclusion, something like that, whatever it was. Um, it is really a, a document that's supposed to help us help you. So let's think about that. What do mediators need in order to help you settle your case? I think first we need to understand what the target is, or if you've done negotiation speak, what your BATNA is. It's, Let's understand what trial is all about. Because to me, in a mediation, all we're trying to do is we want to understand what the trial process is, because that's one option for your future. That's one way to resolve this dispute. 
or you know, what not, we, not what everybody we, went to Harvard, right? Yes. Not everybody might know what a BATNA is. We'll get there. All right. Okay. You need to explain that. All right. So the BATNA, John, is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's your backup plan. It's the option. It's, it's the, a trial. It's the, for mediation, it's generally the trial. All right. right? If we right. don't cut a deal, what's, what's going to happen? We're going to try the case. So let's understand what that trial process looks like, um, and then that's our target for today's mediation. If we can get a deal that you or your clients like better than that trial process, we are in good shape. So we need to understand what that trial process looks like, and you can start that with your briefs. We don't need, like I said, the summary judgment because we're not making a decision on it. We just need to understand as best we can what that thing looks like. So that means give us some facts, very helpful to understand kind of the factual basis for this. Um, help us understand the legal claims. So we don't need the full legal arguments, but you know, this is a wrongful termination case, or this is a copyright case, or this is a breach of contract case, personal injury, whatever it is, um, and these are the, the claims that are being raised. Uh, I think three, the law part of it, if there's a unique part of the law that's going to be kind of an issue and dispute, we should hear about it. If there's some cases or two cases or a couple of cases that are material and then and there's some conflict in it, we should hear about that. If you're just going to tell me that it's your, your client was uh, fired after she refused to have sex with her boss, I don't really need to know the law on that. I know it's wrong. And I think pretty much everyone knows that's wrong. And actionable. And actionable, right. Yeah. So if you give me 10 pages on the law of sexual harassment, not really very helpful. So I mean, you know, use, your, use your judgment on that. But remember what you're trying to do is let us know kind of what's happening with that. Uh, damages analysis, very helpful on both sides. If you're going to be asking for money, break it down and tell us how you got there. If you're on the defense side, you know, go through their damage claims and help us understand why the, it's not as high as the plaintiff thinks it should be. Then finally, um, procedural posture of the case. Let us know where it is. Has, what has discovery happened? If so, you know what kind of discovery? What still needs to be done? When's trial? Who's your judge? That kind of stuff. So we get a better sense for the, for how that looks. All right. So that's one part of the brief is to let us understand the BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, our target. So we know what it is we're trying to beat now. Uh, and then I think part the brief should help us understand kind of what's really going on. Okay, the important part of the brief, the, this, the, the meat of it, the, the stuff we need to know right. to get the deal done. Right? Which is also the hardest part to write because we learn in law school law and facts and anal analysis and all that stuff. That part's easy. You've written a thousand summary judgment motions. The hard part is looking to what's really going on behind the scenes. What's motivating your client? Why is he really bringing this action? Um, you know, is and what, and what, what's happened with the other side? What are the dynamics? You know, was there prior settlement negotiations? I mean, I want to know if you went and had a drink after that last deposition with opposing counsel, and he kind of hinted at things. Right. We call it loose lawyer talk. I, I want that in the brief. I need to know that. How many times, Mike, have you had a situation where you go into one side and you say, "What's our settlement history? You know, what were the offers and demands that went back and forth?" And they tell you. You know, they offered $100,000. And you go in the other room and you say, what'd you offer? Well, we offered $50,000. And it doesn't correspond, you know? At least if they put it in the brief, you get, you get kind of a, a, a heads up on that. Yeah, look, the status of settlement discussions, be they formal, informal, you know, having a beer after the deposition, I don't care, that's really helpful to us. It helps us kind of get a sense for what the bookends are of, of a deal. Um, now, does it matter what kind of brief it is? Because there's at least a couple different kinds. I mean, you got the kind, the secret kind, that you just give to the mediator and make the other side wonder about. And then you've got the more open kind, where you go ahead and you give it to the other side. Does it make a difference? Well, I, you know, I think we go back to the same question of what are you trying to accomplish with your brief? Um, a couple things. If you're trying to, uh, part, of, uh, part of the dispute, the part of the problem, the reason we're even here is because there's a dispute over the law, then I think you want to put some legal analysis in your brief and you want to make sure the other side has it, right? Because you, you want to make sure we're all speaking the same language. If you think part of the problem might be the other side is 
committing malpractice or something personal or, or you know, then you they're might want to keep that. They're just too stupid to understand their case. And so you got to educate them, right? Yeah. Right? So I would say two briefs then. One brief is to educate them with the law, the facts, or whatever it is. The other brief is the private brief to the mediator, a private letter with brief. With all the good stuff. With the good stuff that says yeah. this guy's just too stupid. Although I've got to tell you, it's saying the other side's too stupid. Not that helpful to me uh, unless you can tell me, you know, maybe this, this lawyer has never done this type of law before, or you know, this lawyer is the brother of the nephew, and that's kind of, you know, that kind of relationship stuff may be helpful to me, that doesn't necessarily need to be in a brief that's well, exchanged. Well, you, know, you want to know if the two parties got into a fist fight the last time they got together. That would be helpful, I suppose, because yeah. it, uh, it may dictate what we do in terms of joint sessions. Um, so look, I think this kind of brief can be done in seven to 10 pages. I don't need a lot of exhibits. If you tell me in your brief uh, there was a deposition taken and the witness said X, Y, and Z, I don't need now the transcript of the deposition. I believe you. I trust you that you're going to tell me what the witness really said. You can bring the deposition transcript with you to the mediation if you want to go through it. That's fine. I just don't need a stack of exhibits this thick with the complaint, with every single document, every medical record. Every, you know, focus on the good stuff. It should be seven to ten page brief, whatever the key exhibits are that we might need to reference, and we're done. Well, I agree with the length of the brief. I mean, you get a bunch of those boilerplate slopped into it, and you can usually tell if that's done is when they have, the, have a section there with, with uh, a, a female plaintiff, and they're calling him Mr. Uh, or you got a different name in there. I mean, right. there, there's tells on yeah, there. You got the it's cut, kind of embarrassing. The cut and paste folks. brief. Right. Uh, but a short brief is great. I mean, you know, we're all under time pressure, and we want to be able to, to get loaded up and get loaded up with the stuff that's important. But I disagree on the exhibits. Now, I will tell you, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have disagreed. I had five printers that uh, kept, kept moving all the time, uh, humming all the time, trying to crank out the 500,000 pages and exhibits I'd sometimes get. But I've gone paperless, and so I don't care. You know, you know, give me the Library of Congress if you want. I just put it on my little iPad, and it's all right there if yeah, I need it. You, and uh, you got 100-page exhibits. Yeah. You're reading that in the night before. Yeah. Are you going to go through and read every single deposition transcript that's attached? Are you going to read the entire complaint? Does it help you to read those things? Well, sometimes. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a contract, if it's an insurance policy, if it... Uh, right. If it's a contract and the case is about the contract, we need the contract. If it's right? a bunch of emails, okay, and they're, they're kind of critical to the case. You know, I can go back through. You know, they usually give too much. Right. Uh, but... But I can go through that if I have it, and I can kind of figure out what's important and isolate on that. And, and I'm just more prepared going in there right. if I have the opportunity to do it. I don't want to do it in the mediation. Well, that's why I think the lawyers should make it easier for you so you don't have to be the one to figure out what's important or not. They should already know what's important and give yeah, that to you. Yeah, but they censor. They censor. I mean, I, it, like an insurance policy. They give me a little, little portion of the insurance policy, and I don't get the context. That doesn't right. help me. So if you mediate with John, give him a lot of stuff. And if you mediate with me, just the important stuff. All right, what about um, attaching jury verdicts to your brief? Something that says, you know, we're dealing with a broken leg, and here's like 12 other broken legs where, where there's a lot of money or given or not a lot of money. It's a pet peeve. I, I mean, there are some folks that come in here, and they swear by it. Uh, every case is unique. Every case is different. Every case has a different dynamic, different facts, uh, different personalities, different quality of plaintiff, different quality of lawyer. There are so many variables to go into the trial of a lawsuit. You can't take a jury verdict from some other case uh, and say, oh, because we got $100,000 in this case, this case is worth $100,000. Right. It's silly. But I tell you what, they come in here and they think it's gospel. All right. So it doesn't help you as a mediator in terms of trying to get a resolution. No, it hurts. The case. It hurts right. because it puts in all these preconceived ideas as to numbers that oftentimes, I will say most of the time, don't translate over to the case that's at issue. All right. So that takes us to our next topic. So let's talk about what lawyers do before the mediation. How do they prepare for the mediation so that they can be most effective? Well, they're better. I, I mean, it used to be all lawyers knew what to do was to try cases. Now, most lawyers have a pretty well-developed and sophisticated skill set 
uh, it, with regard to mediation. Uh, what I find is that more often than not, the lawyer has gone in, met with the client, and, and has explained to the client in some detail uh, what the mediation process is and what to expect. You know, we used to have to go in there and spend half an hour, 45 minutes, just explaining what mediation is, both to the lawyers and the parties. Those days are gone. We don't need to do that anymore. Uh, I can't remember a case in recent history where the, the client wasn't prepped up when I said, I, when I asked, have you done this before? Sometimes they'll say no. And I asked, well, do you know what it's about? Yes, my lawyer sat down and explained it all to right. me. And, so uh, prepare your client for the process of mediation, absolutely. right? So we understand what that's about. Now, what they don't do quite such a good job on is managing expectations of the client. I, I mean, you've, had, you've had experience with this. So I, I had one, I had a dental hygienist who the, the creepy old guy kind of reached his hand down and stroked her on the leg. Um, you know, nothing too private, but you know, disturbing enough. She wanted a million dollars. So I can tell you, this is not a million dollar case, um, but she wanted a million dollars and she thought she should get a million dollars and her lawyer did nothing to disabuse her of the thought that this was a million dollar case. I've had that case, or one similar to it, where the lawyer comes in and demands three million dollars, you know, for the fifty thousand dollar case, right? I mean, that happens all the time. Without explaining to the client, this is a strategy. That your right. case is not really worth three million dollars, this is a strategy to get the maximum amount, right? Yeah. So they start hearing that number and believing it. Well, and it works on the defense side, too. You know, sometimes they go and they do these round tables and you know, I don't sit in on the round tables, but you know, it seems like everybody's beating their chest trying to, to be the lowest man on the totem pole yeah. as to the numbers. And so I think sometimes you know, the lawyers will go in there and you know, for whatever reason will really lowball the case. It goes into the round table, it gets really lowballed, and they come into the mediation with these expectations that, that this case isn't worth much. When you know maybe you got the star witness and you got the good facts and maybe it is. Yeah. All right. So preparing your client with uh, you know in terms of reasonable, realistic expectations helps us because now we're not battling some some artificial barrier there. Um, what else for preparation? A lawyer. The, the lawyer needs to prepare. Um, I think the most important thing is that the lawyer arrange access to the real decision maker. Uh, or, or at least figure out who it is and where they are. Um, you know, so often I'll have lawyers come in here uh, representing corporate folks, government, whatever, and, and they don't know who the real decision makers are, let alone having contacted those folks, make sure they're available, make sure they're there. Um, I think it's very, very important that that happen. It creates a lot of frustration in any mediation where, where the other side uh, understands that the real decision maker is not only not there but not accessible. So I think that's really no. important. Um, I had a case a few years ago, it was a big case, it went on for 22 years and uh, it got tried uh, once, it went up to the... Wait, 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 I got, your case went on for 22 years? Yeah, it went on for this 22 is, years. This is not a Dickens novel you were reading, this no, is a real No, no, it's a okay. real case. All right. uh, 22 years uh, it was a securities fraud case. Walter, Walter Matthau was involved in it as a, as a plaintiff and others, uh, governors, uh, you know, senators got sucked up okay. into this thing. Uh, uh, but the, the point is it, it got tried once, it went up to the, the circuit court five times, the U.S. Supreme Court three times, and eventually came back down. Um, and uh, it was sent to me for mediation. And uh, what I learned is that I had this big insurance company involved in it. I learned that the insurance company was privately held and that neither the vice president or the president or the chairman of the board or the board had authority to settle that case. The guy that had authority to settle that case turned out to be the private lawyer that represented the family that held the majority of the stock. And it took a while to dig down to that. Matter of fact, there had been a previous mediation where I had a federal judge 
uh, order the president there in order to put the president in jail <laughs> because they, they, they didn't have, couldn't come up with the, the, the settlement that the judge thought they should have, which I thought was pretty appalling, but it happened. So, so the lawyers need to f do that digging so you don't have to spend 22 years digging yourself. They should know who the real decision maker is before coming to mediation. Yeah, if the client will tell them. Yeah. What else should the lawyers be doing ahead of time besides um, you know, decision maker, preparing their own client? Um, I think know their case. Right? They got to know their case inside and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think so. I, I mean, there's things you can do, and it depends on the size of the case. Um, I've, I've seen some very adept lawyers uh, recently do things that I haven't seen before. Uh, I got a call uh, about a year ago uh, from a lawyer who wanted to do a mock mediation wanted me to come in and do a mock mediation for a mediation they were going to do before another mediator up in San Francisco. And so I went in, I read the briefs, and we, we kind of did it telephonically, but, but we went through the entire mediation process before they went up there. And uh, I learned later they got a terrific result. Uh, but, you know, there are things that I saw that, that they weren't seeing uh, just because I was coming at it from a different direction. So that's something that can be done. Uh, the other thing that I've done, which is a little unusual, I had a big environmental case, and uh, we were getting ready to do uh, a, a fairly substantial mediation uh, with just two parties to it, but, th but they were the major parties. And, uh, and the defense asked me to come in. They wanted to do an educational slideshow for the plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, and they asked to have a separate session with me beforehand to show me that slide presentation and to get my comments as to how to edit it. And, and we went in there, I started looking at this thing, and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> some of the stuff they're saying in here, I knew this plaintiff's lawyer was just gonna go ballistic. Yeah. So we went, we tweaked it, and it actually worked out pretty well. It was very effective. So, so you're saying lawyers before the mediation can use the mediator to help prepare. So yes. whether it's, it's getting outside eyes on the process or outside eyes on the presentations they might wanna make, um, because you, you will be in a more objective position, I guess, to be able to look yeah. at these and see if it's offensive or not offensive, effective, not effective. It's, it's not something you do in the routine case, but you got the big case, you know, and you're really pouring the resources into it, and it's really important that you get it settled. Right. I mean, there are these other steps that can be taken. So, so what else should the lawyers be thinking about before mediation that they should prepare the mediator for? Um, you know, what, what, do you, what do you think would be helpful for you to know? Well, beforehand. The, I think the most important thing is to flag the emotional content. I mean, the general rule is you got to deal with the emotional content before you deal with the money. And if you don't know it's there, or if you don't know the extent or the parameters of the emotional content, uh, you know, you're, you're going to grind to a halt pretty quick. Right. You got to deal with that. All right. Um, what else? Attendance issues? You want to know who's coming, whether by phone or in person or something like that? Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, you need to get that, that wired. If you've got somebody who's appearing by phone, we need to let the other side know. If we got somebody that's going to take a, a, a 3 o'clock flight or has child care issues, I mean, you can deal with anything you know about. Right. right? right. If you don't know about it, it tends to have detrimental effects. Um, yeah. What about what about money issues? You know, sometimes I get into mediation and I'm, you know, we're three quarters of the way through the day, and then the defendant says, "Oh, by the way, we're about to go bankrupt and don't have any money." Yeah. Right? Is that something that's helpful to get ahead of time? Is there something you can do with that information ahead of time? Well, yeah, you can lay, lay appropriate groundwork if you know ahead of time. I mean, if you don't, you're just going to scuttle that effort. I mean, it's, it really is a waste of time. I hate that phrase. I, yeah, yeah, we'll get but, to cliches in a minute. That, but, yeah. but it really is if, if that's there. And, and that needs to be flagged very early on. Um, and the other thing that is helpful are the non-monetary terms. Uh, I mean, you can have something that's very, very important to a party. Uh, and sometimes it's not about the money. Uh, I had a civil rights case where a young man was uh, shot 26 times by three police officers in his backyard, and I had to deal with the parents on that. And uh, when it came right down to it, uh, what that mediation was about was the dad's guilt over leaving that boy there. And uh, until we, we, we dealt with that, uh, and it was five hours in a conference room with, with that man and me, um, uh, there wasn't the, the money didn't matter. Yeah, we were never right, going to get there. Right. 
Uh, but the case settled. It, it didn't settle for a lot of money because he wasn't interested in the money. Right, right, right. Well, we'll get into things, you know, non-monetary ways to look at cases in, in a little bit. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, sometimes in the mediation process, I get lawyers who think that the best way to negotiate is to be kind of a jerk. Right? They want to be tough. They want to be, you know, they're mean to everybody. They're now, mean now to you're the not talking side. about the, the ones that just are naturally jerks. Well, I think even natural jerks, because I know some of them get married, have a nice side to them. So I think even natural jerks, is it's part of their persona because th they think they get an advantage out of it. Um, so I guess that's the question, is, is being a, I don't think it's tough negotiator, I think it's being a difficult negotiator, being kind of a jerk to everybody. Uh, making it unpleasant for the opposing counsel with, with the thought that, oh, they'll pay more money or they'll take less money because they just want to get rid of me because I'm just such a bulldog, I make everyone's life miserable. Is that a helpful quality to have in mediation? I, I think it makes the mediator's job a lot, a lot more difficult. There's a lot of additional groundwork that needs to be, be laid. You have to do a lot more buffering uh, when, when well, that's going on. But I think these lawyers don't care about that if they're getting a negotiating advantage out of it. If their their client becomes you know, gets a better deal out of it because of this act, then they don't care if you, they're paying you a lot of money to put up with that kind of stuff. Well, I, I mean, if it, you know, usually that's going on before they get there. Right. Uh, you know, most lawyers are pretty competent at what they do. Uh, I mean, if they're successful and they're out there practicing law, they've been there for a while, they know what they're doing. And, and most all of them are type A. And so when you push against somebody like that, they push back. Uh, and I don't think that's very productive at all. The other thing that happens is, you know, when you get somebody that's acting mean, uh, they want to surprise and shock the other side. You know, that's part of that MO. And in, in trial, I mean, surprise can be good. That's how you win cases, right? It's to take the other side unawares. Uh, in mediation, it's absolutely deadly. Uh, you know, in trial, everybody's stuck. I mean, you're captive there. You can't get up and leave a trial. Mediation, you can. And, and when somebody does that in the mediation, that's what happens. Uh, people get up, they leave, and it's done. And so that's, that's, not, that's not helpful at all. Well, have you seen mediations not result in settlement because of this kind of behavior? Cases that you think could have settled, maybe the parties wanted to settle, and it didn't settle because this type of negotiating behavior. Sure. I mean, I mean that happens all the time. I, I tell you, to my mind, I, I mean, when somebody comes in and starts doing that, uh, it is a mark either of a lack of confidence, uh, a lack of inexperience, or a lack of competence. Uh, yeah. The really good lawyers out there don't behave that way. And, uh, you know, you, the, the, the folks that are, are most successful, you're not seeing that kind of behavior. And so it's, it's a flag. Right. I mean, it clues me in as to what the issue is there, what, what the issue probably is. And then I've got to decide how I'm going to deal with that. And, and there's any number of ways to yeah, deal with that, that. That's, that's a secret. Don't share those secrets because okay. then people will I, I will tell you. That. I will tell you this, though. I, I mean, when somebody is doing that, it's usually a repetitive behavior. And, you know, I've been doing this 30 years. I've, I've seen all that type of behavior before. I'm bored by that. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm bored by it and I'm put off by it. And it and doesn't help. It doesn't it doesn't help. I mean you want you want your mediator to be working for you. You want your mediator to like you, to like your case, to like your client. Well so let's let's do then the, the flip side of that. What is it that lawyers should be doing? How should they conduct themselves at a mediation in order to get the best advantage for their clients? So if it's not the be mean and rude and you know that kind of stuff. Um, what is it? And I, you know, I think the first thing is uh, lawyers should be respectful. They should be courteous. They should be respectful. They should be professional to everybody, not just to, to us as the mediators. Um, I think when they walk in, you've got the front desk there. You've usually got some, some nice people sitting there checking, checking the lawyers in and checking the parties in. Be nice to them. Um, first, you get practice. You know, that's always good. But these are the people who are in charge of the food. They're in charge of the temperatures in your room, which room you get. I mean, I think you want to generally be pleasant to these folks. Um, but then carry that in. Be, be respectful to your mediator. Yeah. Now, but, but, you know, the front desk is, is interesting, too. 
because when somebody comes in and is a jerk to the receptionist, guess guess who the receptionist calls? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we do learn about that, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we get, we get clued in right from yeah. the beginning. Jerk in room seven, warning. Yeah. Um, you know, be, be nice to your mediators. I mean, why? We like to say that we don't influence the outcome. You know, we're here to help facilitate a discussion and negotiation between the parties, and they reach their settlement and, and everybody's happy. Well, you say that. Well, I, 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 I blatantly think, manipulate. And, I and think of the reality is, is we yeah. do have some influence on right. the outcome. You know, it might not, I probably can't turn a $50,000 case into a million dollar case, but sometimes, you know, you're in a gap and, you know, the way we mediate may have an influence on the outcome of that gap. So why would you want to be nasty to your mediator who's trying to help you? All they want, all, seriously, all we want to do is help. I mean, that's right. how we get into this business. Um, why be nasty to us when we do have some modicum of influence uh, and you want us to use that influence in your favor? So that's just, you know, maybe that's a personal peeve or something like that. Um, but plus, you know, you want to encourage the mediators to stick with this dispute to the very end. Uh, if, you know, if you're dealing with my nightmare medi mediation that I talked about at the beginning, I don't want to help that plaintiff lawyer, you know. So we will follow up, but I, I, my heart's not in it. Uh, other people, though, who respect the process and respect the, the lawyers and respect us, I want to do everything I possibly can to help them. Yeah, there's there's professionalism, and then there's that level above being professional. Right. You know, there there's there's the commitment. Uh, that, you know, and really having people there that you care about, you really want to help. And uh, you know, I think that's that's the usual case. Uh, but you know, you start off neutral, right? You start off neutral. Everybody's mm -hmm. on the same playing field. But you know, you don't necessarily end up neutral. So, hear what he's saying, um, and I think I th this one I think is really important. You want to also be courteous, respectful, professional with the opposing counsel and the opposing party. I mean, it, what shows more confidence than walking into the other side, shaking your, your opposing party's hand, introducing yourself very politely, saying it's very nice to meet you, um, and being polite and respectful to the opposing lawyer. It just people and, who and, do that and complimenting them in front of their client. Compliment them in front of their client. You'll amazing things will happen. Now yeah. you've just raised the the opposing lawyer up in the eyes of his own client. And you've got credibility. I mean, how can you be wrong if you understand how how, how, great how their amazing lawyer. their lawyer yeah. is? Exactly right. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think when I think of the nightmare mediations I've had, it's the lawyers who come in and they constantly scream into me the other side. They're lying. They're lying. They, they give a. Uh, um, an explanation of their legal position. They're lying. Well, they say they've got a witness that says this. They're lying. You know, and it, yeah. um, you know, besides being unbecoming, it shows that they kind of don't have confidence in their own case. You know, so the professionalism to me and com and, and courtesy just you know exudes a level of confidence that I think makes everybody pay more attention to that. Well, person. and the other thing is, is it is it triggers the principle of reciprocity. I mean, right. reciprocity is is so uh, prevalent in our society. I mean, uh, you know, somebody takes you and your wife out to dinner. Before you sit down, you're thinking about, okay, how do we reciprocate? Uh, when you're dealing with discovery issues, lawyers trade things off. Uh, they engage in that reciprocity. Right. I mean, if you're nice to somebody, they're more likely to be nice back. But the real telling thing about that is in the results. You know, what I've found in year after year, case after case, is the lawyers that come in and have that civil, professional demeanor get better results. Yeah, I agree. I agree 100%. Um, so I think you know, following on our, our theme of being respectful, uh, lawyers need to be respectful to their own clients. You know, and I can't tell you the number of mediations I've had where, you know, and I, I get the realities of the business, that sometimes the lawyers come in, they've never met their client before. You know, yeah. Usually it's contingency cases and they've got a volume business and, you know, that's fine. I get, I get that. But I think in that process, the lawyers, you want to make sure you are respectful to your client. Get, make them part of the process. Make them understand, you know, help them understand what's happening. Because um, I've had a number of lawyers who will essentially bring the client and then leave them alone and then just deal with me out like in the hallways and stuff. So don't worry, I'll tell the client what's going on. 
Um, and, I, you know, I think you want a happy client. And you want the client to be engaged in the process and to be able to come out feeling like they were part of the solution. It wasn't imposed on them. So I don't know if, if you've had that experience. Or well, not. I have. And I always find it a little disturbing. I, ha I had one lawyer uh, come and uh, I had a pre-mediation conference with this lawyer. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm having some client control issues. Uh, he says, I, I think it would be very helpful if at the beginning of the mediation you come in and, and you spend a little time with my client just explaining what, what the mediation process is and, uh, and, and clue him in as the problems we have with this case because he's clueless. Mm -hmm. So I do that. I go in there, I sit down, uh, I'm talking to the client, I'm explaining the process, I'm explaining the weaknesses with the case. And all of a sudden, the lawyer looks at me, pounds the table, and says, well, I think we're done here. <laughs> I don't have to listen to this. I mean, what do you think you're doing? Do you know what you're doing? I thought you were a mediator. It seems to me you're on the other side's case. I'm done. I think I had that lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, so I was a little taken aback by that. Um, you know, and I said, fine, we're done. Yeah, I done. Well, he didn't really want it to be done. No, no, he no, was he's showing just, off. He's just showing off. Yeah, right. So, he so pulls, later he pulls me aside yeah, and he says, so, yeah, I want to keep going. Yeah, I had that lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if you are that lawyer, yeah. make sure we know beforehand that you're going to put on a show in front of your client and say, that's outrageous. Because, look, we, we understand you need to be your, the champion for your client. You need to be there really pulling for them. You know, if you need to put a million dollars down on a $50,000 case to show your client you're really fighting for them, that's fine. And we want to support you with that. Just let us know ahead of time. Either call us up or meet, meet us in the lobby or something so that we're not fooled, too. Well, so we're not surprised. I hate surprises. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't even like Christmas gifts that are wrapped. <laughs> all right. Well, that's good to know. Um, all right. So, so we've talked about you know, lawyers and their conduct and their civility. Uh, civility, I mean, really, civility will take you not just mediation but through litigation. It'll take you through life. We're, we're, all, we're big fans of civility and kindness. Um, what else? What else should lawyers be thinking about to win at mediation? Well, they need to be objective about their case. I mean, I understand zealous advocacy, and I, I think there certainly is a place for that. Um, and it's okay to be a zealous advocate, but you shouldn't let that advocacy overwhelm your judgment or your objectivity with regard to what you actually have here. And I think mediation is is a place. Uh, where reality is tested, um, and and if you have have doubts about your own objectivity, one of the the big benefits is going in there and getting the viewpoint of somebody who who hasn't been down in the weeds with you and is more objective about the case. But you know, but, you want. But, but yeah, why do we care about objectivity? Well. First of all, I mean, if you're not you objective, okay, mm -hmm. if, if you're arguing with the mediator all the time and you're, you can't get off of the, of the advocate's wheel, the yeah, advocate's right. wheel I, your credibility goes to the, to the basement. Uh, I mean, you know, you either think, you know, this guy doesn't get it, he doesn't un understand the mediation process, he doesn't understand uh, his case, and, you know, maybe he's not such a good lawyer. Uh, and maybe he just, his credibility goes down. You, you, you tend not to, when somebody is pushing malarkey at you, you tend not to believe much of anything they say. Yeah. So here's, here's a way I, I also look at it. Remember, it goes back to the bat and the target issue. You know, we're trying to understand what the trial target really looks like so that we can develop through the mediation a settlement you like better than that. You know, so if you think about it, if you were going to buy a car, and you have, and the dealer offers you 10% financing. Would you take it? I don't know, right? It depends what your other financing options are. You know, maybe you could get a 5% uh, financing, in which case, turn it down. Right? Or maybe your other option is 20%, in which case, take the 10%, right? But you don't know whether to take it or not until you know what the, your options are. And so if you're sitting there believing, I can do 5%, I can do 5%, I can do 5%, you're going to turn down the 10%. You're going to go out there and find out, uh-oh, my best deal is 20%. I made a mistake. And so you want to be as objective as possible 
when you're negotiating your financing, you, you want to know what your option really is. Is it five or is it 20? Because that's the only way you're going to make a good decision on the 10. Well, and the other thing, you know, when you, you go in there, if you have unrealistic um, notions about your case, uh, you know, that's rubbing off on the client. I mean, you're pumping up those clients' expectations and you're making your client management job a lot harder. And uh, so it, it, it never, it's never beneficial to do that. All right, so, so I find this sometimes. Lawyers who will not acknowledge there's a weakness in their case. Um, have you seen that? And, and is that kind of what you're talking about here? Is that you, you want them to actually tell you, all right, you know, I get it. This witness was really bad for me. Uh, you know, or if you've got a copyright case where they're claiming willfulness and you say, all right, it's true, I've got an email where it looks like we took their stuff and I sent it off and asked it to be copied. You know, do, you, do you share that with the mediator or do you kind of hide it? And, and well, I mean, it's, you know, most of it uh, is going to be gut checked in the other room, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you may not tell, tell the mediator about that bad witness. The other side's going to. Right. And so the mediator sitting here with all that data doesn't have an opportunity to, to double check it with you because because you're in denial as to what's going on, as opposed to the lawyer that sits down and says, okay, I know I have these problems. This is what I'm doing to deal with these problems. Yes, okay. Okay? Uh, lots of credibility there. So the stronger lawyer sits there, they, they, they'll acknowledge they got the bad, the bad yeah. email, but they'll say, and here's why I'm not worried about it. Right. Because, you know, it's this or it's that. This is, they tell you how to manage it with the other side. Yeah, so right. then when the other side brings up the bad email, I mean, you're loaded for bear. You know yeah. what to do with right. that. Right, right. Okay, so good. So, so be honest about your case. Be, a, be open to uh, learning about the case. Be objective about it. Um, I, I, I get frustrated at the lawyers who argue with me constantly because I'm not trying to fight with them about their case. I'm trying to make sure we all understand what it really is. Well, they treat you like, like the advocate on the other side. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and uh, that's not what we're doing. Even though we're, we're talking about some of the other issues, we're really not fighting with them at all. We don't we just want to make sure we're all talking about the right thing. Well, and the, it wastes so much time to do that. I mean, the lawyer sits down and just lays it out for you. That doesn't take long. And then you're out of that room, you're in the other room, okay, and, and you're doing work. You're doing work for them. As long as that lawyer keeps you in the room with them, arguing over the same things over and over again, they, you're not doing any good for them. Um, you know, the, the objective ought to be is to bring the lawyer, the, the mediator in there, uh, keep them in there until you're sure that they understand your case and sure. you've got them loaded up, and then kick them out to go work with the other side because that's how you advance your interests. Right. All right. Um, so what about um, being objective about the opponent's case? So, you know, we've talked about being objective about your own case. Have you seen cases where the lawyers... Um, Everything on the other side is just trash. Maybe it's just the flip side of being objective about your own case. It's understanding about the other case. But what I, what I tend to see are lawyers who will not even be open to understanding what the other side's case is about. Or the potential of the other side's case. Yes. Okay, because you have, you have different styles and manners of preparation uh, for trial. There are some lawyers that front end load that. And these are the lawyers that, you know, usually they're working by the hour and, and they've, they've put all their effort into the front end and they think they really know this case and they've got the other side at a disadvantage. They haven't done the work. And what they haven't seen is that a very talented plaintiff's lawyer pull that case together in the last two weeks and have it all fresh, have it all there, and be absolutely loaded for bear when they get to the point of trial. Um, and so they tend to grossly underestimate uh, what the other side is capable of. Except in those cases where they don't. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's true. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, what you're saying is that there's an advantage to a lawyer to be open to learning about the other side's case, right? Yeah. So ask questions, like, what do they have? I mean, don't you want to know what their best shot is they're going to take at, take at you? Oh, it's an incredible like, learning opportunity in mediation. I mean, we all learn. Uh, oftentimes... You know, what I will say to folks at the beginning is don't come in with preconceived ideas because this is an educational process. At the end of the day, we're going to have a lot more data. Right. Good decisions are made on good data. And, uh, and, and you also learn about 
you know, the other side's case. It helps with the trial preparation. If you, you know, a, a mediation session is rarely wasted time. I mean, there's always something that comes so out. You're always that. learning. You're always learning. Well, and I think that's going to, you know, goes back to the conduct towards the opposing counsel because there will become opportunities where we will bring in just the lawyers right, to talk about the case. Um, and here's an opportunity for a lawyer not to advocate their case. This is not, you know, opening statements. It's a perfect time for the lawyer to be quiet and say, tell me what you got, and then to listen and really try to understand the best thing that the other side has to share for you. And I think that's what you're talking about. This is, these are opportunities to learn if you're approaching the mediation in the right mindset, you know, not as I'm the advocate, I'm going to win, but as you know, I'm a sponge. Let, you know, share well, with me. Tell me why. Why is my case bad? I think that's a great question. Why is my case bad? Let the other side tell you. Yeah. Well, and and ask questions uh, to the point of uncomfortableness. I mean, what what I have good lawyers that really understand this process too is they'll keep asking questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, what is their position on this? What is their position on that? What evidence they have? Until I get to the point where I'm pushing up against confidentiality. Right, you want to make your your mediator a little uncomfortable with with the, the number and depth of questions you ask. So when I get to that point, that's when I bring the lawyers. I I don't, let's bring the lawyers in and then ask the questions directly. So we try to set it up to make sure the temperature is right and the personalities are right. But those are fantastic questions to ask, and and do it in a non-offensive way. You know, yeah. don't cross-examine the other side because it goes back to the push. You know, type A push, I'll push back but do it in a very, you know, friendly, open way. It just help me understand why this, uh, why this email that I have that shows you sending my stuff to the other side saying, copy this, please. Help me understand why that's not just a killer, killer email. Well, it, it, and, and the other thing that can happen uh, is it gives you an opportunity to test your themes, your evidence, your legal theories. Uh, with the mediator. I mean, we've been around the blocks a few times, and we're looking at it objectively. I mean, you can get a lot of feedback just, just from the mediator. And some of it depends on the mediator's so-called style. You know, we have this issue about being facilitative, being a violative. I mean, these days we're all that. Yeah, right? yeah. Just, you know. just mediators. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, and, and if, we, if we need to go in there and evaluate, or if you ask us to do it, we'll do it. And you get good data. Yeah. All right, so let's keep moving. Let's look at uh, the notion of being creative, uh, because uh, mediation, the mediation process, it really has no rules. Confidentiality is a cloak that covers it, so that's sort of a rule that, you know, that's very helpful to the process. But other than that, um, we have the opportunity to do lots of different things to help the parties break through and, and find resolution. Um, I think the, my, my, if I have something to share to lawyers on this issue, it's don't be afraid to be creative, or if that's not natural for you, don't be afraid to let the mediator help you be creative. You know, um, I, I'll just give you a, a quick example. I'm, we're starting to mediate with millennials now, and so I'm learning a little bit more about how millennials think, and um, I, I gotta tell you, if you're a millennial, you think differently than I do, so, sorry. Um, but to me, sometimes, it's not just millennials, but sometimes people like things. So we can settle cases with things. Uh, I had a case where we settled a case with Taylor Swift tickets. We couldn't find a reach agreement on the dollars. It was too far apart, but then we started talking about Taylor Swift tickets. There was a backstory to it, which I won't go into right now, but um, it made a material difference to this party to be able to get that, and that was able to get us through that. Why we're talking about Taylor Swift tickets in a mediation, I don't know, but the lawyers let this kind of brainstorming session happened and that became the issue that, that broke us through. Um, you know, I, I had a case where the, fa the father was um, uh, lost his job, didn't have a lot of money, raised, a single dad raising his, his child by himself. Um, we were having trouble crossing the, the final gap and we said, well, what if we could get you tickets to Knott's Berry Farm? Not just tickets, season passes. So it cost the defendant, I don't know, you know, 800,000 bucks or something like that. But the dad's now a hero because he now can afford to take his son to something really special the two of them could do that they couldn't do otherwise. Um, and that was enough to kind of get us through it. So, you know, don't be afraid to think creatively about the outcome uh, and not to mention, you know, 
my fantasy one where we had the kumbaya moment and we had all that stuff. That uh, well, and, and and creative business deals. I, I mean, one of the things I'll often do in a contract dispute or in a partnership dispute is you know you, you deal with buyouts, okay? You, you deal with mergers. You deal with acquisitions. Uh, I mean, you deal with business expansion. Um, there, there's all kinds of creative ways to deal with business conflicts uh, that go beyond you know what you can do in a lawsuit. So it's, it's always money. I, I've, you know, almost, almost never if you settle a case about money. Well, but money there, and ego. But there are other well, things in addition to the money that we can do to yeah. create value for people. And that's really what we're looking for is ways to create value to the parties so that they'll like this deal better than the trial deal. Right. So, you know, we're, we're trying to explore the kind of the underlying needs of the parties. You know, so when we're asking your clients, you know, how do they spend their day? I mean, part of it is we, we're just trying to chit chat and get to know them a little better. And part of it is are we looking, we're looking for ways that we might be able to find to bring value to their lives. Um, you know, find out what's important to them. What's important to them. Why are they bringing this lawsuit? If it's an ego issue, maybe there's a way we can address the ego issues to help get this case done. Um, so I think the lawyers who understand that that's part of the process and allow that to happen and contribute and participate in it, I think end up getting much better results. Um, all right, so what about um, not just creativity in the outcome, but creativity in the process? Uh, yeah, I think it takes a, a good deal of trust in the mediator, depending on what you're willing to do. Um, and how much control you're, you're willing to cede to a mediator. But there's a lot of things that we can do. And, uh, you know, once you get to the point that you, you recognize that we care about the case, we understand the case, we're trying to get to the, the objective. Uh, you know, I love it when I walk into a room and, and you know, I'm in shirt sleeves. I don't, I don't wear a coat, right? It's because I used to be a judge and I get to do that. I mean, it's a where's, power thing. Where's your robe? Yeah. Uh, so. But I, I don't sit at the head of the table anymore. I, I deliberately go in the room and I sit next to the client. Um, and I try to engage. Now, some lawyers won't let you do that. Uh, other, most lawyers will. And you spend that first few minutes getting to know that client, uh, getting to know what those interests are, and building trust. And, and the lawyers like it because uh, they see that you're building trust with the client and it, towards the end game, it's going to help in terms of client control and client commitment to the deal. Um, I, I love it uh, when we're sitting around and the, the last offer came in and, and there's an open discussion of how do we respond to that, you know, as opposed to, oh, we need to talk about that, you know, Mr. Mediator, please get out of the room. And, and it gives me uh, a much, much better feel for what the dynamics in that room are and the interests come out. You know, what are we trying to accomplish? I mean, it's all there. You get a better feel for the right. parameters. So if you had lawyers not allow that to happen? You know, they try to stop you from having those kinds of conversations with their clients? Well, yeah, I think particularly when they're formulating a response to a proposition. You know, there's a, there's a tendency to exclude the mediator from that. Well, I don't even mean that part. Even the part sitting next to the client and engaging them in you know, some personal chit-chat. If you had lawyers who've kind of tried to stop you even from doing that. Oh, I've had lawyers say, what are you doing? Yeah. I don't want you talking to my client. I mean, you talk to me. You don't talk to my client. And when, and client, don't you talk to this guy. Yeah, all right. So that gets back to my, my nightmare mediation. Yeah. So uh, do you see any advantage to that kind of uh, conduct in a mediation? I mean, is there any possible negotiating advantage that somebody could have? get by doing that? Well, I'm a control freak, and when I was on the other side uh, doing mediation advocacy with Irel Manella, um, you know, I was a, a mediator's nightmare uh, because I would go in beforehand, I would assign roles to everybody's going to participate in that mediation. I would tell them what they could say and what they couldn't say. Uh, I, would, I would put in signals to cut them off if they were getting out of line because I, I wanted control over that process. And, uh, and I did feel that there would be some disadvantage uh, if, if something that I couldn't control was coming out. So it kind of depends on how big right. a control freak so, you are. But now, in retrospect, now, now you've got distance between that John Wagner and today's John Wagner. Uh, if you have a mediator you trust, 
would you have given different instructions to your people now? Yeah, if it was somebody that I trusted, I, and usually that takes knowing them beforehand, mm -hmm. I just back off and let them do their thing. Just let them do it. Because they know what they're doing. All right, so trust your mediators. Um, sometimes mediators will come up with some kind of crazy process change. Because, I mean, frankly, some, when we get stuck, we're thinking about what else can we do? What do why are we stuck? What do we need to mix up to try to make some progress? The dynamite. If that's what you call it, the yeah. dynamite, okay. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta blast, blast loose the log jam. And, yeah. um, you know, and I've seen you know, one of our, our colleagues in the International Academy of Mediators has taken his clients to a Buddhist temple. And let them sit there. Dropped them off and left them there for a couple hours. Yeah. They, were, they were old business partners and just they had to sit there and for a couple hours. And when he came back, the case was settled. Yeah. Right. So that's a kind of a, an out there thing to do, a little weird. On the other hand, because he had been in the in the both rooms and had worked it and prepared it properly, he was convinced that this would be something that would be useful. Um, so have you, have you done other things that are that are kind of unusual? And what are you telling lawyers to do? You know, when you're making those suggestions. Like, yeah, I, I had a had a dispute um, uh, amongst family members who owned a very very lucrative business. They're making all kinds of money, but they all hated each other. And I had had one of these parties, um, and his brother-in-law, and uh, and, the, and the one party thought he had a pretty good relationship with the brother-in-law. And I found out from the brother-in-law, his brother-in-law hated this guy. I, I mean, felt that he had had really taken advantage of him and disserved him, and and didn't treat his wife fairly, and was really quite upset about it. So I said, okay, we're going to have a meeting between you two. It's going to be the two of you and me. And what I want you to do is I want you to unload. I want you to tell him exactly how you feel about him in this meeting. Uh, and, and don't hold back. So we go, we go and have the meeting. This guy unloads. Okay, He goes back to his room and I, I deal with the, uh, the, the, the other guy. And he looks at me and he says, I had no idea he felt that way. I feel so badly. He says, of course. I'll take this next step. Of course I will accommodate. I've got to mend this fence. So so wait, so what did you do with the lawyers to set this up? Because I would have to imagine their lawyers at the beginning are saying, why would I let this happen? This is ridiculous. Why would I let my client go in there and get yelled at? Well, th this, is, this is a matter of trust. These are lawyers I had worked with before. Uh, this wasn't the, the first mediation between the members of this family. Um, and so I had a track record at that point. I had settled a number of other difficult cases between members of this family. And so there was a sufficient trust level at that point that they, they let me do that. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, I mean, what separates the really experienced uh, mediators from the ones that are just newly in the area uh, is that it's, it's both the experience and the willingness to mediate uh, dangerously. Uh, you know, to take calculated risks when you reach those long right. jams. But I think that's the key. They're calculated risks. They're not. It's not. It's dangerous in the sense that it hasn't. It's not normally part of the mediation it's process. It's not reckless. But it's not reckless, right? Yeah. Things have been set up in advance to make sure that when we're suggesting something like this, there's a good chance it's going to work, and we've got processes in place so that if it starts to go south, we can stop it. And you know, so it's a protected process. In that well, sense. it's kind of. It's kind of like you know. You take a, a lawyer right out of law school and put them in a courtroom, they'll be able to try that case. They'll be able to stumble through that trial. But that's not the same as a guy comes in, it's got 200 jury trials under his belt, right? It's a whole different experience there. Same thing with mediators. You've got somebody who's new, I mean, you know, they've gone through the training, they know the basic steps to go through. But it's not the same as somebody who's been doing it for decades. Uh, you know, when you do that, you, you build up a, a reservoir of experience and you begin to recognize patterns of human behavior. Right. So when you run into a situation like that, you've already kind of pegged these people. You've already ha you've, you've had this situation before and you know what's worked before and what hasn't worked before. And so, you know, it gives you an opportunity to calculate, okay, what is that risk here? And, and minimize the risk. All right, so a couple more things, and then we will be done. One is, I think for lawyers, take it easy. Have a little humor. Um, 
this is not the end of the world. This is a really informal, I think it's kind of a fun process because the opportunities are so large to, so, uh, so many opportunities for creativity in this thing. There's no judge out there who's judging you. There's no one out there telling you you're doing a horrible job. This is a time for everybody to kind of relax a little bit, explore, uh, and try to find ways that can settle a dispute and make people happy. So I think, you know, if lawyers can come to the mediation with that kind of an attitude, uh, it doesn't mean that we're not serious. We're, we're serious. We're trying to help everybody settle the case. but. Uh, to maybe take some of the seriousness out of it. I don't know. I just think that helps a lot. Well, it should be, you know, a, more of a of a relaxed um, yeah. Yeah, place. Better you know, a, a safe place for people to go. Uh, what I've found is that, that over the years, my approach has changed. Uh, I used to be pretty stiff in mediations. Um, it, you know, they, they, there are so many different kinds of things get thrown at you as a mediator. Um, they teach you that at judge school, right? How to be stiff? Uh, no. Yes, no. Right. I won't admit that. You know, whether <laughs> it's true or not, I won't admit it. Uh, but I, I think over the years, I've learned to kind of relax and be a little self-deprecating uh, as, as you go through it. And that, and that triggers it. But it doesn't have to be me. I mean, right. anybody in that room. And, uh, uh, you know, when there's something funny that's said, it breaks the tension. You know, it's okay to laugh, um, and uh, it helps the parties. Right, that happens. I, that's what I think. And, I think, and that's, I guess, the point of this, is if the lawyers are relaxed, they act like they've been through this before, the, their clients will feel much more relaxed. You know, and then when, when you're relaxed, I think everyone can be a little more creative about things, um, you know, and, and I think progress is a lot easier to make that way. All right, one more thing, and then we'll do some don'ts. Never give up, never surrender. Um, you know, the thing about mediation these days is that it's an ongoing process. You know, it used to be we had one day to get it done. Uh, we come in there, we we try real hard to get it done, or we wouldn't. But that was the end of the story. Not so much these days. Uh, most most mediators will uh, are willing to continue to follow up on the case, uh, do a second session. Uh, you know, sometimes cases just aren't right. right. I had a case here recently where I did a half-day mediation um, and then followed up with, I added it up later, $30,000 worth of time over the course of the next six months. And let me guess how much you billed for it. Yes. Not, not a lot. $30,000. Oh, did you? Right. <laughs> I did. Well, you know, if you're doing that kind of work. Now, if it had been, if it had been a couple of weeks of phone calls, I wouldn't bill for that. Right. I don't think most people would. But if it's something that's going to stretch out for six months and take up yeah. that type of time, yeah. I right. mean, everybody else is billing for it. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Um, all right, so the idea is that for you know, the media. But, but they asked me to. Good. They asked Always me to. Always important. Okay. And, and I guess that's the point of this is yeah. the lawyers – shouldn't give up. The mediators won't give up if the lawyers don't give up. Right. You know, we try to hang on afterwards to follow up on cases and do everything we can to get them settled. Um, but we need cooperative partners for that. We can't do it by ourselves. So the lawyers, I think what you're saying is if, um, you know, build off of the mediation process and keep, keep, keep working, us in. keep working with the mediators yeah. to help get the deal done. Okay. All right. So let's go through a bunch of don'ts and maybe we'll just do this shotgun style. We'll throw them out one at a time, and if you've got something interesting to say about it, say it, or yeah. I will, and um, we'll see where we are. So a lot of these don'ts are very similar to the do's, but the flip side of them. So, uh, for instance, don't be rude, don't be argumentative, uncivil, or disrespectful. Covered. Next. Right. Oh, don't constantly argue, especially with your friend, the mediator. We covered that. Uh, don't treat the mediator as anything, as just a tool. I think the mediator can be a tool. I think the mediator is a tool. Uh, it's, it's one of the tools in the litigator's tool chest these days. Um, so, yeah, temper that uh, one a little I bit. I think mediation is the tool, not the mediator. I mean, the mediator is, is helping, but I don't think you want to treat the mediator like he's your pencil, you know, and you're going to control the mediator and tell him what to do. And, and, you know. It took me a long time. Uh, to get over black robe fever, and uh, uh, and these and back off and recognize that the mediation process isn't entirely mine anymore. 
Uh, I've learned to show more respect uh, to the lawyers. Um, it let them to, to have more say-so, to be, to be uh, more receptive to suggestions, uh, and to suppress my own ego, uh, to at least work at that, uh, to, to where, you know, if I'm going to be a tool, I want to be a sharp tool. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll buy that. Um, but next, don't don't unrealistically inflate your clients' expectations prior to the mediation, so they come in thinking a fifty thousand dollar case is a million dollar case. Yeah. All right. Okay. So get, let's do one more. All right. I, I get I get really sick of the uh, tired old cliches. All right. <laughs> so what are some of your favorites? Um, they're just wasting my time. Just wasting my time. How often during the course of a mediation do you hear that? So I, I, sometimes I get it if I start my mediation at, you know, 9.30. By 10 o'clock, I've got, this is just a waste of my time. But, um, and then I'll get them like every half hour until the case settles at the very end. So Right. I mean, I mean, the model for mediation is, right, you sit around all day, you do a bunch of talking, you go back and forth to rooms, uh, waste a bunch of time, and then you settle the case. So, waste, so I should be telling these lawyers when they say, this is just a waste of my time. I said, yes, it is. It's fantastic, isn't it? This is going to get the case settled. Yeah. All right, what's another one? Operating in bad faith. Yeah, they're just operating in bad faith. Yeah, I mean, you hear it 10 times, 20 times, 50 times in the course of mediation. It gets really, really old. And I think by their definition of bad faith, it means they have not accepted my proposal. So therefore, it must be in bad faith. Yeah, they don't agree with me. They don't agree with me, so they're in bad faith. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Another one. Uh, I'm not going to bid against myself. All right. That's Tell a me. big one. That's a big one. Hey, you know. And so, sometimes we'd like it to bid against yourself. There's an advantage to bidding against. There yourself. There is an advantage to bid against yourself. I mean, I mean, it, it's it. First of all, it, it's so ingrained in our society. You never bid against yourself. If a mediator can get you to bid against yourself, that means a mediator has all this power in the room. So then at the end game, when the mediator tells the other side, nope, that's it, that's the bottom line, it sticks. Yeah, right, they believe it. And plus, you know, it gives you an opportunity to invoke that principle of reciprocity, yeah. right? You know, you bid against yourself, then maybe they'll bid against themselves, and you right. move the process along. It's a good tool. It's a good tool, I, and I agree with that. I, all right, um, one more. What do we got? Too oh. far apart. Non-starter. That's a non-starter. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's actually a starter. Yeah, it's starter. Just, it might be way out there. We're always we're too far apart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why are we here if we're not too far, far apart? Right? If, you, if you weren't too far apart, you would have settled the case. Um, all right, let's do some more don'ts and then we'll be done. Don't slander your opposing counsel or party, even in the confidential caucuses with the mediator. But Mike, it feels so good. It, yeah, I guess if you're going to do it anywhere, do it in the confidential caucus with the mediator. But it's not helpful. No. It doesn't provide any value other than maybe you get a cathartic release or something like that. But yeah. um, it does, the, the confident lawyers don't resort to bad mouthing their opponents. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it shows a, a little bit of a lack of character. Yeah. When that happens. Right. So. Uh, okay. My favorite. All right. Okay. Don't whine about past discovery disputes. <sighs> discovery disputes. We don't care about discovery disputes. Do you care about discovery I disputes? I do not care about discovery disputes. Is there any disputes? discovery dispute that helps us get the parties to a resolution? Well, they, they, they always always want to use a discovery dispute to kind of slander the other side. Yeah. Like, like they're incompetent, they're not doing their job, uh, they lied to us, yada, yada, yada. But, I don't care. I know. It doesn't help mediation. It might, it might help. You know, we're not trying to say it's not important in the litigation. It might be important in the litigation. You might be able to get a motion to compel and get some sanctions and, you know, whatever. But well, and, for and mediation, I don't care about that. Right? Well, it doesn't help us. It's not to say that it's not helpful to exchange, you know, key documents. And, you know, sometimes you need more discovery going forward. But I don't care about what's already happened, nor can I do anything about it. Right. It's like the people come in, they complain, well, they didn't respond to my discovery stuff. What do you want me to do about yeah, it? Yeah, right. I mean, I can't do anything about it. today. Yeah. All right, two, two more. Uh, one of them, and I mean, they're kind of related. Um, the one I I hear a lot is, um, hey, Mike, just want you to know, there's a big listserv out there among us you know, plaintiff's lawyers or defense lawyers, and uh, I tend to do a lot of posting on that listserv. <laughs> 
Um, I, you know, what am I supposed to do with that? Now I'm afraid that I'm going to mediate poorly and you're going to badmouth me on the listserv. I'm never going to get hired again. Um, you know, it seems to me that that's an effort by the lawyers to just do a little dig on the mediator. It's almost threaten them that I will badmouth you. I can tell you that it doesn't really help your case very much. I don't know what your experience is. I agree. And, and I'm running into it more and more and more. Uh, I get kind of a bad reaction to it. I don't even like it when they come in and they say, hey, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm on this listserv and uh, there's lots of good things about you on that. And, and I gave you a good posting. Yeah. Right? right? I mean, it's At least I bad. like that one better than, hey, I might, you know, yeah. do something bad on you. But, but, but either way, I mean, it really doesn't have And the reality place. is there's listservs on the plaintiff side. There's listservs on the defense side. If we think about the listserv issue, we can't do our jobs. So we just we ignore that stuff anyways and just yeah. mediate the best we can. And hopefully we do a good job and you'll say something nice and not something mean. But. Well, no, nobody really wants a neutral mediator, right? They always yeah. want the mediator to be on, on their on side. On their side, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And we're always, we are on your side. I just want <laughs> you to know that. We are always on your side. All right, any others that we want to highlight? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's anything else that uh, is really so important to take up the time. All right. You know, so, most important thing about an MCLE program is you got to know when to say, we're done. Yeah, we're done. Thank you very much.